Hello again, it's Alex from Barefaced and this is part four, yes four, of the guitar cab prototyping discussion-y talky type thing. And what I have here is a mock-up um, of how the whole thing started, which was, as you can see, extremely high-tech. We have here a Black & Decker workmate, um, that's not an advert, um, had that a long time. A speaker, this is a one that got, I think got damaged in transit anyway, so it's just been kicking around the factory um, doing nothing. For the real demonstration, I used a good speaker because using a bad speaker would be a bad idea. And now this is, this is where it gets really technical and complicated. Two pieces of plywood. Please ignore the holes in them. These are just offcuts from the thing, so I'd have blocked up the holes in reality if I'd been doing it like this. So we are mocking up something I did in 2014, 2015, when I had this idea about horns and diffraction and stuff as related to using those old, old audio concepts as you know, from gramophones or megaphones or anything like that, and applying it to a guitar speaker to solve problems that happen with guitar cabs in the real world. So, what I did, I didn't get out any measurement microphones, there was no computer analysis at this point, but what there was, was a speaker, and I did this with the back as well as the front, but it's easier for you to see with the front, me putting these in front of it and experimenting with how varying the distance to the cone. So we've got we've got that distance there. Yeah. We've got the width of this gap. Yeah. And then as you can see if I do it further, the angle of these two bits of wood. So what I'm not doing here is doing anything with low frequencies because we're treating this as a completely open case. So any lows that are coming from the back are cancelling the lows from the front at any wavelength that are large in comparison to the diameter of the speaker. So that's a lot of lower frequencies. Uh, yeah, we're not generating any Helmholtz resonances. So there's nothing going on like would happen with a horn subwoofer or a transmission line or anything like that. What we are doing is we are messing with the radiated response in the mids and the highs. Now obviously if we put that in front of that it's going to block sound. That's fairly obvious. But what you may not have considered is that when you put this in front of this you're actually increasing the mass of air that the speaker is moving by basically holding a body of air in front of the speaker. So that's going to affect the response throughout the frequency range. Now when you do this again you're holding that mass with it so that added mass is going to affect your treble response and it's also going to shift the low frequency response but not in a way that we'd be able to perceive in this open baffle design or baffleless design. Then we've got this issue of this gap here. Now the wider the gap the less it does. Obviously if, it, if the gap's this wide then it's not doing anything. As it gets narrower it has effects and from my fiddling around having sound running through this and literally keeping sticking my ear in front of it and having a listen um, I observed that as we go narrower we start to get a low pass filter effect happening so that's like when we roll the tone knob back on a guitar or a bass so that is blocking off high frequencies in the case of a tone knob you're bleeding high frequencies to ground in this case what we're doing is we're adding an acoustic inductance in the form of this added mass here and it's blocking off the high frequencies and I noticed there was a very with guitar because bear in mind this is guitar speaker guitar speakers don't go that high they go to say six kilohertz something like that um, and adults can generally hear to an octave higher than that sort of 12 kilohertz and if you've got decent hearing you'll go higher still I think I think I get to about 15 or 16 kilohertz, which isn't bad for my age, but yeah, look after your ears. On that subject, I've got some new um, custom molded earplugs. Uh, I had the previous pair for about 20 years and then somehow I've lost them. I don't know where they went, but 
I think that's a pretty good run on something that small. Um, anyway, so we've got this low pass filter effect that was happening here, but then what I noticed, which is what I was hoping to notice, but you kind of end up doing a bit of sort of self-controlled blind testing or grabbing someone else from the, the factory and saying, here, listen, what's happening? You know, close your eyes and have a listen. Um, and that what I noticed was once the gap got narrower, you actually got more. Now, just wind back a bit. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because guitar speakers, or all speakers, have directionality. But guitar and bass speakers particularly suffer with directionality because they are large speakers. You know, this, this is a lot bigger than a hi-fi speaker, or certainly a hi-fi full range speaker, and they are running full range. So we end up with a speaker where the speaker starts to become large compared to the frequencies it's putting out. So compared to the wavelengths of the frequencies it's putting out. And with any wave source, once the sound of the wave source, the size of the wave source gets big relative to the wavelengths it's putting out, the directionality increases. And you will know this because if you stood absolutely in the line of fire of a guitar speaker, you will hear more treble. It's, it's really obvious. You'll actually hear more mids, more treble. And as you sweep in, so here I'm at 180 degrees off axis and I'm coming round. There I'm at 45 degrees and there, you know, 30 degrees ish, 15 degrees, and then you're on axis. And the sound changes drastically. And the problem with that is who, if you set up your tone to be exactly right where you're standing, how does it sound for everyone else in the room? And this is the big annoyance that I was trying to solve with guitar speakers with this concept. So yeah, what I noticed was as you narrow this gap, you start to increase the dispersion of the speaker. So you start to get more of the mids and more of the highs heading off sideways. So it evens out the tone from left to right. But if you make the gap too narrow, you start to lose those high frequencies. So the high frequencies that are coming through are getting diffracted, but a lot of them are starting to get blocked by this acoustic filter that's caused by the narrower gap and the air mass sitting in here. Um, obviously, as we go closer here, there's the potential for having resonances. So you've got a gap. So you'd end up potentially with standing waves but, but from speaker to plywood and back which probably won't be a good thing. And again, it's one of those things where you just, you just try it. You just move these bits around and listen. Or I did, at least. This is what I did. So then once I'd started finding a gap that seemed to work and a distance for a that seemed to work, I started going narrower. So started messing with the angle. And there's definitely, there's a, there comes a point, if you go like this, obviously, you start to get leakage around these sides. But if, if they were really long, what you end up with is this acting as a horn and giving you a lot of gain in a certain mid-range frequencies. And it starts to sound honky. And we, we, we know this from, from life experience. You know, it's just, it's just what happens if you make sounds down horn-shaped things. And that's due to quarter wave resonances and, and acoustic impedance and things like that. So there's, there's maths and science and physics behind it. But what we're looking for is something where we, we're trying to get a solution where by putting these in front of the cone gets the same sound as the cone on its own but, or approximately the same sound as the cone on its own, but instead of the cone sound being very, very bright here and much duller all the way around here, 180 degrees to zero degrees off axis. That's not 180 degrees, 90 degrees off axis, sorry. 90 degrees off axis, 180 degrees would be standing behind it. So we're wanting to get a consistent tone across a broad listening area. We're not really worrying about up and down so much because rooms, well, not this room, but most rooms are, actually, no, let me correct that. Even in this room, this is, this is a fairly cube shaped room. People's ears, even in a narrow, tall room, most people's ears 
are in about the same height range, most adults' ears. So we're, we're dealing with a fairly narrow range of heights, but people could be standing all the way over there, or all the way over there, or all the way over there. So we want sound to spread laterally, and we're not so much bothered about it vertically. Now, to make things clear, I was never planning to put this in front of the speaker, because cool though this can be, and can do good things in taking the sound that's coming out of the front of the speaker and dispersing it better than the speaker alone, it does mess with the tone. And we don't want to mess with the tone because there is a reason people love the tone of classic guitar speakers. They just work. They do their weird colorations in a way that makes guitars sound great in all sorts of different ways and all sorts of different speakers behave in all sorts of different ways. And that's why this concept I had was all about trying to keep the great sound of guitar speaker but give it better dispersion like our fancy bass cabs that manage to do it or like fancy PA cabs that do it because they have alternate solutions because they're not tied to a classic tone caused by colorations from a 10 or a 12 inch diameter normally speaker. So we'll turn this round. This experiment involved the back of the speaker. So again we're doing the same thing now we can't get as close to the cone here because we've got the magnet in the way, motor, magnet, and obviously the cone has a, this cone has depth and the frame has depth. But basically doing the same thing. You will see from here that you can see the cone. Yeah? So all those bits of cone you can see are letting sound out. Now the air mass in here acts as an acoustic low pass filter, just like we were discovering with it in front. We've also got this blocking the cone, and if I, having just turned it round, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to turn it round again, I'm going to grab another speaker. Let me re remind you that in the centre of the cone, you have a dust cap. A dust cap is really critical to the sound of guitar speakers, and you will come across models of guitar speaker where the only difference between two quite different sounding models is the dust cap material, because by changing that, you really change the treble response, because a lot of the treble comes off the dust cap. So the material, the shape, the damping that that material has, you know, the, the mass of it, uh, the rigidity, you know, the, the resonances, all these sorts of things affect it in cool ways. And the way people prototype guitar speakers, a lot of it is just trying different materials for the dust cap to see how <clears throat> it changed the tone, because it's that, that forever sort of hunt for clarity without harshness, warmth without mud, and that dust cap material is critical to that. So, <clears throat> back of the speaker, you can see that we can't see the dust cap. All we can see are these portions of the cone. There will be other portions of the cone that we can't see, but are still radiating sound. So there's bits of sound down in here, down in here, that will come out and bounce around and come out of this, this window between the, the legs of the frame. So, I experimented with our gap with these. I think I used taller bits of wood, but I, I honestly can't remember. I, I, I might have been doing it like that, but we are talking a long time ago. I'll do a, a hunt to see if I've got any photographs or video from when I originally did it. But, yeah, so you can see this is all about, it's all about diffraction through a slot without messing up the tone and then finding an angle that would help that diffraction and help the tone. And when it's out like this, you know, that you haven't got any sort of gain from these panels acting as a horn. As you go narrow, you start to get a lot of gain, but across a very narrow frequency band, and then, but also you narrow the dispersion there. And there comes a point when actually somewhere in this region, I started to notice we were getting better off-axis response and a more even tone from the way it was bringing up the mid-range in a subtle way without introducing sort of honky, unpleasant colour. Now you may say to me, why bother? The reason why it's worth bothering with this is in a closed back cab, there's sound coming off the front of the speaker. The sound coming off the back of the speaker travels backwards, travels sideways as well to a degree, bounces around inside the box, 
doesn't generate any useful output, but does leak back through this cone, because it's only a thin bit of cardboard, and colours the sound in ways we don't really want. It makes things sound muddier. Um, now, if you're listening to a speaker, the sound from the speaker is coming off it this way, but all the frequencies that are large relative to the size of the speaker aren't coming off it in a directional way, they're wrapping round. So whatever you do with the guitar cab, at low frequencies, it's got omnidirectional output. If you're in any space that's got any walls, any boundaries, so anything but an anechoic chamber or an enormous empty field with a cab standing on a sort of tall tower, you will have reflections from that omnidirectional response, which then brings that sound back to wherever you're standing, even if you're standing in front of it. Now, if we can take the sound that's coming off the back and get that to join the sound at the front by virtue of being reflected, then... Someone's trying to come in the room. Goodbye, please don't come in. Um, then we will have a more even sound wherever the cab is in the room and wherever we are relative to it. Now, you may say, well, isn't that what an open back cab does? thing about an open back cab is the sound coming off the back of the speaker then ends up bouncing around in a fairly cuboid shaped box so that adds a coloration we don't really want because of these standing waves top and bottom you know left to right and stuff like that but also the low frequencies <clears throat> from an open back cab at the back if this is if the front is positive phase the back is negative phase and when they meet the wavelengths are long enough that there's been no significant phase shift, so the positive phase here meets the negative phase here and cancels out. And you get a much thinner tone, so you can't really do chunky guitar sounds with an open back cab. And you will know this because you've seen people playing guitar, you've played guitar, you know what gear works for different sorts of sounds. And if we look at situations where guitar really struggles in terms of dispersion and sound like that, particularly with heavier sounds, it can be a real problem in that you end up with a lot of mid-range, but it's just firing in a beam. But in the world of guitar, there's always a lot of mid-range going on, and we want to hear that mid-range in the right way wherever we're standing. And my idea was that if you can take the tone that's coming off the back of the cab and through this and spread it around, it will find its way back to you because it's reflecting because we're in a space that almost invariably causes reflections. And now this is where there's a quite a cool thing. Due to the way the human ear works, if we hear two very, very similar sounds, at a very short time interval, our brain takes the second sound, or the group of later sounds, and adds them to the first sound and locates them off the first sound. So if you can get sound to come off the back of the speaker, which sounds sufficiently similar to the sound off the front of the speaker, our brain thinks it's the sound off the front of the speaker. This is a natural consequence of evolution and our brains being trained to um, keep us alive really. So those of us who are good at hearing a predator trying to eat us and locating it and ignoring the fact the sound of that predator is echoing off a canyon wall and we know the real sound is the sound closest, um, we survive and you know that's how we have ears. They're a, they're a, a communication tool. Originally started as a survival tool, and you know it's continued to be a useful survival tool. If you can communicate, it's it's easier to work as a group, and so on. So yeah, so that that was how this started. A workmate, a speaker, some bits of wood, obviously some music going into it, some guitar sounds and things like that, and my ears and whoever else happened to be around me, sort of grabbing them, going, "What are you hearing?" Is that doing that? Um, so that is how we got to sort of step one of the prototype where we weren't trying to do any Helmholtz resonances or anything like that. But I thought that was important for me to sort of recap to that because you're probably wondering, you know, 
why is the gap that width and why is the angle the way it is? Um, and that's what we've sort of submitted through the, the patent for this. So I will sign off now. Ask me questions because I'm sure that's been quite a long chat. Um, hopefully the angles have made sense for that I've been filming from so you can see what was going on. But yes, it's a funny uh, flashback. I was doing it in the corner of the factory so I had to keep being like, quiet, quiet, I'm testing. Um, anyway, thank you. I've been Alex from Bareface. That has been another video about the guitar cab AVD concept prototype -y thing. We've been making them and selling them for a few years now. Um, so there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Actually, we might be in the thousands now. Hmm. All over the world. Lots of very good reviews from people. Uh, Sound on Sound made it gear of the year. Um, hardly a bad word. It's been really nice. I thought when I came up with this idea, and then when I finally got this idea to work in the way I wanted it to work, I thought this is, this is literally the biggest leap forwards for a guitar cabinet in 70 years or something. I still think it is. And everyone who's using it, well, almost everyone, like, you know, way in the high 90%, seem to agree with me. So it's just a question of spreading the word because it does make life better when you're playing gigs. And isn't that what it's all about? So thank you. I will be back. Goodbye.